today we're going to conclude our series on the Bond show. We're going to continue with um, the Brosnan years onto the newest James Bond film, which is Casino Royale with Daniel Craig. But before I begin, let me introduce my guest, Mr. Eric Cohen. Say hello. And hello. Mike Foltz. Today we're going to talk about the Pierce Brosnan years, and let's get on to it. The first Pierce Brosnan film, after a long hiatus of six years because of uh, legal entanglements, uh, Pierce Brosnan came back and made Goldeneye. What I have a problem with that now, now Pierce Brosnan was uh, in the running f to play Bond ten years earlier mm -hmm. in The Living Daylights, and because of a TV contract we talked about earlier, yeah, he couldn't do the role. The so now Timothy Dalton was tired because he was in six years waiting to get in it, and he just said, I'm tired of waiting, and I don't want to do it anymore. So they, got, they went back to the original choice of Pierce Brosnan. Now, Which I thought was terrible. I have to agree with you. I thought Pierce Brosnan, it's just he, the thing about that Timothy Dalton, I thought he was the strongest Bond since Sean Connery, is that he had a very, just a very physical presence. You mm -hmm. felt. I agree. Know, he, he, had, he was a very imposing figure. He was serious, and he had all the great characteristics of a great Bond. He was, you know, the good, good looking. He was tough. He was suave. I mean, you, but you could believe that he could kick your ass in a fight. Oh, absolutely. And he's not, not, not saying because he's muscular, just because he's a very intense actor. I mean, he's yeah, an intense Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I like Dalton as an actor. Um, I would say that I wish he made more Bond films than what he did because he had only Living Daylights and he had License to Kill. And I thought License to Kill was a big misfire. We had this discussion. Yeah, we had that fight. And I think, I think that there are things that Dalton was awkward about. And it may not be his fault. It's just the kind of the way they, they designed the scripts. They didn't really play to his talents as an actor. Mm -hmm. um, I thought what Brosnan was, he was sort of like, please all factions Bond. You know, he had the elements of Connery. He had the elements of Dalton. He had elements of Roger Moore. He was kind of like the fusion Bond. Well, what I said earlier, I dreaded Pierce Brosnan being named Bond. I thought it was the word. I thought it was so uninspired. I thought it was such a lazy choice. I thought, well, how could they bring this TV has been and dig him up to have him play Bond? I just thought there were so many more inspired choices that they could have made for the role. And then I saw Goldeneye, and I completely changed my mind. I, I actually don't didn't care for Goldeneye the first time I seen I saw it. I, I've warmed up to it over you know, a couple of viewings since then. I think, I don't like the visual style of the film. It feels very cheap, even though I know it's not a cheap film. I don't like the new direction they took Bond in. Um, I thought, the problem is, is that Pierce Brosnan had potential to be a great Bond. I just feel that they never gave him, like you're talking about mm -hmm. Dalton, they never gave him the material because Goldeneye was, was, of all the movies, it was probably the most serious of all the Dalton films. Um, Brosnan. Brosnan. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, all the Brosnan <coughs> films. Mm -hmm. But <coughs> as they went along, they got more and more ridiculous. They became into the, he became the. But I that's guess not say, Brosnan's fault. Though. No, it wasn't no, Brosnan, and they became him. kind of contradictory. I mean, we're going to find this thread. We, we should move on to the next films because yes. they're all kind of like they're all they, they all, share the same yeah. criticisms. Basically, it's like they couldn't decide whether they want to go the Dalton Bond route or the Roger Moore Bond route. And what happened was they had this or the Connery this kind of or the Connery Bond route. And the problem is, you would have these moments where okay, now it's getting dramatic and serious, interesting, and then suddenly he's a superhero. Yeah. Which yeah. would completely, like, it would be jarring. It would be a jarring change. It's like leaping out of this flying thing, you know, a wa this water vehicle to k latch onto a balloon. And that's followed by some serious moment. The only thing, he was, moment. The only thing was missing was a cape. And yeah, a, and yeah. There's, like, things level. there where it's, like, little, and I, and I agree with Mike. I like Brosnan. Up to that point, Brosnan was my favorite Bond since Connery. Mm -hmm. I thought he had, he was a much better actor than I expected him to be. Um, I just, um, you know, they just, the problem is with a guy like that, and you look at him visually, you think this is a model type. He's a pretty boy. And that's what he sort of had against him. Um, and his scripts didn't really help him out. In fact, the best scripts he got were, you know, I thought his best Bond portrayals were things like uh, Taylor Panama and, uh, you know, the, the, Matador. The, yeah, Matador and, and, you know, and the Thomas Crown Affairs were like, if he played Bond like he played in those parts, he would be a kick-ass Bond. I, like I said, I thought he was great as Bond. I don't fault him at all for the poor uh, scripts. I mean, that's the broccolis right there. Now, to, to to the one thing I will say that's really good about the Brosnan era Bonds is that for the first time you felt like the movies were directed. Whereas, you know, the Roger Moore era leading up to, like, maybe Dalton, my the, only criticism about the, the like, original right Dalton. Universe. The, the, yeah, the, the uh, John Glenn years. It didn't feel like it was directed by second unit all the way through. These, these, all the Bosman films had a distinct visual style. You know, you could tell there was a different director attached to each one of them. Some of them were not as good as others, but at least there was an attempt to kind of update it in that way and not just make it just another one in the series. I found, I found that the reason why the Brosnans were so very une uneven, well, not only because of the scripts, because the scripts were... Phew, uh, but I felt the villains 
were ri really uneven throughout. Uh, I, I have mean, to be honest with you, those four Bond films, I would say you have four of the worst villains in the Bond universe. Would be oh, those films back I then. could not disagree anymore. I think Sean Bean's, uh, what, 006? And he's a terrific actor, I want to put His that on record. His 006 is fantastic in GoldenEye. I just, I thought he was great. Matter of fact, I thought he was the best. I always seek a villain in a Bond film. I always look for the next Red Grant. I want somebody physically the equal of Bond to go up against. Well, let's and uh, and I thought Sean Bean was uh, uh, cl close as we've seen in years. And then after Goldeneye, it just seemed to regress. I mean, you had Sophie Marceau. Uh, her villain I thought was great, but there was it's so a great much, in concept. But there was so much crap that it held under. I a mean, lot of it is great in concept, but in execution, yeah, execution just they don't go. Great. I mean, like Sean Bean was great in concept, but then he becomes just like yeah, another one. Where I, this is the problem of the Brosnan films in, in a nutshell, and this sort of encompasses all the films. They start off with a really intriguing concept. Probably the best example is, is Die Another Day. They, mm -hmm. they had this like, wow, that's a great idea. Bond is captured and tortured for six months in, in, in North Korea. And the whole title sequence is showing that torture, which, and I, which I thought was a phenomenal idea. Mm -hmm. and, and he comes out a wounded man, but then there's a minute where they drop that and he becomes a Superman again. And he's like forgotten he's been and incarcerated. And they, they don't right? follow, like the Sean Bean thing, they don't explore the fact <coughs> that they had a friendship, really, you know, which would have been really, I, I, I would say, I would even go further than what Mike said. I would love to see a villain that's not only Bond's equal, but someone that Bond's like, you know, I like this guy. It's kind of confused about having to do his job for king and country, mm -hmm. you know, and and queen and country. Well, queen and country sorry, you are well, correct. Close enough, we got it. Um, but uh, but you know, they just don't want to go there. Golden Eye though Worst villain. was was I think was probably maybe maybe one of the stronger films in the Pierce Brosnan mm -hmm. years. But then he went on two years later. It opened uh, which and then made another film which. I know Mike doesn't like it, but I thought it was it was my personal favorite of the Brosnan years because at least it was fun. It was very stupid, but it was fun for me, which was Tomorrow Never Dies. Mm -hmm. um, I liked, now, unlike Goldeneye, I told you I didn't like the visual style in this one. Mm -hmm. I loved the visual style in Tomorrow Never Dies. I thought it was a very beautiful oh, looking film. I hated the visual style. Uh, I liked it. I hated thought it was the a editing. very red... I didn't think there was any excitement in it because it was like music video editing and there was like no suspense, no thrill. I remember like when I saw it in the first time in the movie theaters when they had the first pre credit sequence. And I was like, what just happened? You know, it was like, so Bond gets in a plane and flies away while being, and it wasn't exciting because it was like edited in that quick, like rapid kind of MTV style. And it was just like, this has no business being in a Bond. Who was that? That was a Roger Spottiswood? Roger Spottiswood. The Spottiswood, yeah. Was actually an and, and everything was just like so quick to just like tell the story to the point where it's like, it was all hyperactive. And I just found they myself. They seemed like they were in a hurry to get to the end. It, well, it, it, was, it was like, it was like the least memorable Bond film for me. This, this is another criticism I have about the Brosnan years is that you had no sense of geography in these films. Yeah, you know that one <laughs> film took, we had this like North Korea thing. The other film was in Hong Kong, you know, stuff like that. But it all felt st studio bound to me. You felt like it was on a Hollywood Yeah, set. It's, it's like you didn't, you don't, rec you know, it's like, in that fact, the whole, all the Brosnan films felt like one film to me. There was like no, you know, the, the plot wise, it, they all seem to be like the same plot. I huh? love Jonathan Price. And he's For actually the fans very, out yeah. there, good. I love Jonathan Price. He's terrible in this movie. He's a good actor. Ridiculous. I mean, I thought he was decent, but they don't give him anything really to do. They don't do anything. It's, it's the them. screenwriter's fault. The screenwriter and the producer's fault. And I think even though you get somewhat of a unique sense with Martin Campbell or mm -hmm. Roger Spottiswood or uh, what's his name from... Uh, uh, Lee Tamori and uh, yeah. Michael Adapted. For, uh, yeah, Michael Adapted. Michael Adapted. Yeah. Even though you're getting different d distinct styles, I guess, it still feels fairly like the director has very little control of what's right. going on. It always seems like it's producer-driven and you got the screenwriter, whoever the producer puts faith in that year. And that's about it. I don't think anybody else seems to have much input. I want to focus on the strong points about Tomorrow Never Dies which I do like. I thought Michelle Yeoh was one of the best That's Bond That's the only good thing. She's phenomenal. She gives, and she's an sexy. equal. She's an equal to Bond, which I thought was very interesting. And she, and I like that. I, I do like, um, I do like some of the, some of the set pieces. There's a great action scene on a, a motorcycle in this Chinese village. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, like you said, um, there's problems in the scripting department. As from what I understand, they were rewriting the script as they were going along mm -hmm. to meet a release date, which happens with a lot of these big films. They're not, they're just, they're rushed out, they don't have time to write the script, and there's a lot of plot holes. Um, I will say that even though it was a goof, bit goofy, at least I was entertained by it because it didn't try to focus and tell a story. It just tried to go from A to B and just be action-packed, and it did. And there's a great scene at the end, I thought, with on a boat, a stealth boat, which is, you know, it's more believable than a, a stealth car, which we'll get into in another movie. Uh, in let's minute. say there's one scene in, in Tomorrow Never Dies, which I think is 
actually one of the best scenes in a Bond film, ironically, in the Bond. Really? One of the best scenes. It goes up there with the best scenes in a Bond series. And that is just this one little scene where Bond returns to his hotel room, finds his lover murdered, and he has that conversation with the assassin that sent it. And it's just this bizarre kind of humorous but kind of tense moment. And you just wish the rest of the film were like that. And There's just, some no. dark elements in the movie. That, that, that one sequence is, is a really well done sequence. And how Bond outwits him and gets out of it is really clever. But Yeah, well, I want to say another thing, too. It does have one of the worst Bond songs in recent memory, which is Tomorrow Never Dies by Sheryl Crow. Oh, so yes. Mm -hmm. Very, very the bad. Worst one. Actually, no, second worst. We'll get into the other one in a, in a little minute. But uh, that will bring us to our next film. Uh, which is The World Is Not Enough, if I am correct. Mm -hmm. yes. yes, please forgive me, because the other few films were so bad, they kind of merged together. It was directed by Michael Abdet, who is actually a very good director. And unfortunately, he even said he took the film because he said he would never get offered a film like this in his career. He was surprised. He only directed dialogue scenes, from what I understand, and all the action scenes were directed by a second unit director. Um, unfortunately, this film was probably, to me, the worst of all the Brosnan films, even though it did have some very good elements in it. It's still, it's just a very boring film that, that unfortunately, just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, I, I agree with you. It's, it's interesting, though. I think that this is where Brosnan's coming into his stride as Bond. He it's did, his a really good performance. He's a tough-ass Bond in this one. Um, and... But the problem is, again, is that contradiction in what, what they're trying to play to, what audience are trying to play to with this movie, because he would do these superhero things, and then, and then there would be these moments where he's supposed to be touched by certain things, you know, and, and, and feel emotionally connected to the villains. And there's a point where, like, okay, if you're this superhuman this way, there's no way in hell you wouldn't have figured out her scheme. Yeah. At some point, you know what I mean? It just it doesn't. It just makes him look stupid. Yeah, he's able to. And figure Bond's out not everything. dumb. Yeah. yeah, and it's like, and, and so and so. There's a lot of things that are wrong. I mean, right away, you're you're setting up a lot of wrong when you're trying to present, you know, superhero Bond this wet time, and then like emotionally detached or trying to be connected to some female another way. I I have a I have a feeling on Bonds is, and I know this is a very cheap way out on things. But I feel that Bond films are only as good as their villains. Thank and goodness. And this was a so. very confused villain running because Sophie Marceau's um, millionaire scheming woman mm -hmm. was great, but very underused. They're like, let's think of uh, this wonderful villain that's a really beautiful woman. You know, let's get right to Bond's weakness. Have a beautiful woman um, as the villain. Let's find. It. Let's not do a thing with her, but let's have her in, you know, like you said, in concept re rather right. than execution. Right, concept is a great idea. And then you have this Serbian uh, assassin soldier, Robert Carlyle. And that's a, one of the biggest ways to And it reminded universe. me of uh, Batman Returns where, you know, you have the Penguin as an arch villain, and it's like, he's not a real villain. You should just feel sorry for him. You know, because... Well, the thing is, I was never more excited about a casting choice. Yeah. And I never been Robert so Carlyle. disappointed. And the result. nothing to do. Just Does nothing. Robert Carlyle, I want to go on record, is a phenomenal actor. Great I mean, actor. this guy is so freaking underrated. I mean, he's probably one of the best character actors working today. The problem is, he's given a role in this movie. He's given a great idea of mm -hmm. a villain that feels no pain. And then you don't do anything with it? You know, it, you know what's funny is, is they decided to go the real dumbass way out by making him feel pain in his heart with this affair that he's having. You know, with you know what, I would have been happy if it was a villain awful. with, if it wasn't a villain with, I mean, I, I mean he, they didn't even have to have that no pain element. Yeah, I mean, it's just a, just a, just a it's, gimmick. Just, I mean, just the fact that he could be a scary terrorist. A really MacGuffin. And, and they're trying to do that MacGuffin. whole, like, you know, Patty Hearst thing, where it's like, you know. The turns, Stockholm Syndrome. Right, and, uh, you know, that's an interesting, again, Doesn't a lot of good ideas. It. Don't do anything with it. Exactly. And, 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 and another thing, too, I want to mention. Worst Bond girl ever. Denise Richards. I oh, say yes. second worst Bond. Uh, I, I still don't think she holds a candle to Tanya Roberts. Oh, well, I give you that one. Yes, she absolutely. was drunk most of the I time. Will say, that, I will so. say this, though. Uh, worst James, uh, sorry, Bond girl name, Christmas Jones. But, however, there is a good line that, I, obviously, she was named for this uh, mm. this line that comes at the end. Christmas comes only once a year. Yeah. Mm. Which is actually nice. kind of funny, but it's well, stupid. It, but depressing if you're the one in bed with her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and another thing I want to mention, too, is the introduction of the John Cleese character. Um, where, and the new Q. The new Q to make it more uh, gimmicky. And there's a scene, too, which is a really stupid where Bond is in the, uh, I guess, the Alps or a mountain range, and he saves himself with like a, pl a plastic beach ball. Yeah, it was just his whole, his whole snowsuit it, like it, it comes And, and the problem, really... too, is it looks like on paper they were trying to tell a more serious it, it's, story. It's silly, and then there's that serious moment where he's trying to like calm her down. And just like, again, that's the big Brosnan era. Well, you problem. can tell John Cleese was a choice of the studios. That was somebody that the producers picked and the studios just went apeshit over. If they would have casted like an unknown, I mean, first of all, 
You're never, as a Bond fan, you are never, ever, ever going to replace Desmond Llewellyn. You're no just way. not. This is, this is your cue forever yeah. and ever. I don't think all of us as Bond fans were as attached to the M, the actor that played M, which mm-hmm. I forget his name right now. Uh, Bernard Lee was the first actor. I yes. mean, he's wonderful, yeah. but not as attached because we had Llewellyn for such a uh, much longer period of time. And he's like your favorite uncle that you got to see. Now we'll go on to the film that actually ended the career of Pierce Brosnan as Bond. And unfortunately, I will go on record as saying it has the absolute worst James Bond song, which is Die Another Day, and the song is by Madonna. But uh, it's pretty, uh, Cheryl Crow's is, Cheryl Crow is pretty horrible. The though. Madonna Madonna one is the worst. Even even when the composer even says it's the worst Bond song. Thank God it's only five minutes and you have me for the rest of the two hours. You know it's bad. And that's the guy who actually came out and said that. And also Madonna does make then a cameo for God's sake. But the film is Die Another Day. It was the 40th anniversary of the James Bond franchise. So of course it's loaded with references to the other Bonds, which actually come out as very distracting. It's like seeing a, don- a ton of celebrity cameos, mm-hmm. which keep co- popping up every few minutes. And it's like they want to keep showing you these little things like, oh, it's our 20th, our 40th anniversary. Look at this, fans. Yeah, as a screen, I think the producers make the screenwriter do that. And gives me a headache. I don't like referencing like older stuff. Oh, it, it's the, for the cute moments, and you want to hang yourself. Exactly. I don't mind one or two, but when they come yeah. at every, like there a are ways you frame. do it right, and there yeah. are ways that you just. It I don't even a think. I don't even think you do it right. I, I think. I think I if you're a good writer off. and you're creative enough and you're a good producer, you can pull off anything. It's just that if you can't, don't do it. Well, you said also yeah. Halle Berry. You know, Halle Berry <coughs> is the Bond girl in this, and she was actually the first Academy Award winner at the time to play a Bond girl. And her first appearance, of course, is very reminiscent of someone else, Ursula Andress and Dr. No with the same outfit, which is like, okay, people, we just did this in in Austin Powers a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Why do it again? Then there's some some other references. And also, the thing is, like you said, it started off with probably the best opening of a Bond film in years with, uh, with um, uh, uh, James Bond being tortured with a beard and handcuffed. It's and also a great action sequence. It is a great action scene, but then it goes it, Leading up to that, it was, it was one of the better action sequence uh, pre-starters to a Bond film I've seen in a while. I thought it was very well done. And it, the, the, you, we're, I'm not going to repeat myself, but it's like out of nowhere, he's, he's, he's in that like hospital kind of bed. And he, and, he, and, he, and he gets up and he gets out and he just swims, you know, to his hotel and gets into his hotel room. He's back to being superhero Bond again. And it's like, completely forget No about ramifications. That. None. No I, consequences. I, I must say I was very entertained by Die Another Day. I'm very, very surprised very, very entertained. It was, a very, it was out of all four of the movie, it was, it was the most popcorn-esque movie where I could kind of shut down a little bit of my brain and enjoy it. Although my brain did come back on and was cursing a little bit at the invisible car. Mm-hmm. Yeah, e- even with the scientific explanation that Q gave that it was a series, a car that had a series of tiny mirrors all over its uh, chassis uh, was pretty w- lame. Well, it was a reach. Well, yeah. And everybody thought, oh, gosh, Halle Berry's jinx is so wonderful. She's so wonderful that they have to make a, a whole movie franchise of her. I'm thinking, did we see the same movie? Yeah, because exactly. she wasn't the best Bond girl I ever no. saw. No, no, and like I she's, Lois, she's not very good in it. Actually. No, she's she, not. She can't handle the one line. Then again, and... Halle Berry's not that good of an actress. I no. hate to say, one one role does not make a career, folks. No, no and uh, and the thing is, this, she's not in with the you know with the Bond universe. She feels completely uh, feels completely out of it. I mean, I didn't feel like she even belonged yeah. as a Bond girl. I, I, mean, I agree know? with Mike though. With all the, the silliness in it, I think it's the most entertaining. Uh, of that kind of Bond. You, know, you had two different kinds of Bond films. You had more down to earth, more like, you know, thriller esque ones, and then you have what they call the over the top Bond films, you know, like Spy Who Loved Me, Moonraker. And all well, this one stuff. reminded me a lot of Spy Who Loved Me. Not Spy Who Loved Me, but Moonraker. It but but, me but this was like probably uh, Brosnan's best over the top Bond. The, this you know? is, yeah, this, to me, this was like, uh, you only. And, and it's twice. a lot of fun. And Toby Stevens is is a solid villain. You know, it's an, it's an interesting idea. I thought that was a very creative idea. Yeah, sure it's, and I thought it was interesting that it was his, you know, Bond's DNA that made him what he became, you know, the villain. And, and it's, it's you know, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. I think I it was the sword Brosnan's fight. best performance as Bond. The sword fight was wonderful. The sword fight was a lot of fun. <coughs> I like yeah. the introduction. It, it's a film, really, it's, 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 it, although it's silly like Tomorrow Never Dies, it, 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 it's better directed. Even though they did nothing with him, I liked Michael Madsen being in the film. But then again, I like Michael Madsen getting any sort of work. Yeah, well, he doesn't really Damien, do much in this yeah, film. Yeah, Damien Falco or something like yeah. that, I think is his character's name. But I will say this, I like this one better than The World Is Not Enough, which is my least favorite of all the Pierce Brosnan films. Well, after a, a long hiatus for Bond films, actually I believe it was four years, I'm not mistaken, um, 
there was a uh, Quentin Tarantino came out in the press that he would love to go back and make Casino Royale, which was the only uh, Bond film, a Bond book not owned by the Broccoli's, and make it with uh, Pierce Brosnan. Well, when this idea came out, uh, there was a way to get the book. Uh, for the Broccoli's because they made a deal with Sony uh, when there was a lawsuit many years ago against the Kevin McClory and they were able to get the rights to Casino Royale. However, they did not go to Tarantino and they also they dropped Pierce Brosnan, which was a very controversial choice at the time, and decided to go with a new Bond. Uh, the relatively unknown at the time, uh, Daniel Craig. By the way, to drop Brosnan I thought was a good idea because I think Brosnan was too old. He was too old. I mean, there should be a rule where they have to retire at a certain age because, I mean, we there were talking be, earlier about how right. Roger Moore went on too long. Although I think Brosnan would look a lot better as Bond now than Roger Moore oh, did. Oh, yes. All right. Well, Casino Royale, I will go on record and say, is probably one of the best Bond films. It probably has the best debut of a new Bond actor ever. I love the theme song. I thought the opening credits were phenomenal. This is a new Bond and I absolutely adored every moment. Of um, I agree with what you say, and I also add that for the first time you see a Bond film where you, it's not just actor plays Bond, then stuntman takes over during the action sequence, and then we go back to actor <coughs> playing Bond. Um, I thought for, for the first time in a long time since the Connery era, um, the action scenes told you as much about Bond as a character as, as anything else. I mean, I th you know, you, you see how Bond thinks. And they're very careful to pro portray that, um, how, how he's a means to an end bond, how he's going to do everything he can to make his objective, even if there's collateral damage. This is the first Bond film where there's ramifications. Mm -hmm. People die. Uh, definite collateral damage. Um, and, and with all the talk about being this grim, gritty film, it's also, you know, there are moments where he's like funny on a very human level that's different than any previous Bond's ever been before. I would, say, I would say that that's where he's more successful than Dalton was. Dalton was a great dramatic actor, but very awkward when it came to humor. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think he understood humor. I, you know, I think at, one, at some points I thought that Dalton was, was, was convinced he was playing Heathcliff and not Bond in certain, in certain times. Very, very Shakespearean kind of work. Whereas, whereas uh, Craig has that balance of very subtly portraying you know, these, these human sides. And I, I, I think you know, the relationship between him and Vesper Lind is, is, is very interesting. I think uh, Le Chief, uh, the actor, I forgot the actor's name. The man with the bloody tears. Yeah, is, is, is a very interesting villain, largely because he's doing what he's doing because he has no choice, because he's totally screwed if he doesn't. And there's a desperation in what he's trying to do. That torture scene between the two of them is really well done, very well acted. This probably has the best script of a Bond film since the Connery years. I mean, it's a terrific And now's script. my time to come in, because I kind of disagree with that. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. I went well, over I this film this. with a fine-tooth comb because I had it hyped to me so much that I was going to watch every frame. But you were prepared to not like it to begin with. Um, he, this I, is a man who refused actually, to see the theater. Actually, part of me, well, that was like hype mm -hmm. just to you know drive you crazy. But I kind of thought I was going to like it just mm -hmm. because I badmouthed the Brosnan and Goldeneye so much mm -hmm. that when I saw it, I was like pretty surprised. Um, I thought, I, I had numerous things about this film. It, it, it's hard for me to know where to start because we, we uh, I, like I said, I had this film hyped to me and I had no desire to see it whatsoever. And I'm a huge Bond fan and I, I guess I was originally stuck on the idea that I did not see Craig as Bond. It, you know, it, it, it was in my head that it wasn't that I could see other actors doing it, but I couldn't see Craig. So I watched it. And for the first half of the film, if not for the first two thirds of the film, the first thing I thought is Daniel Craig has two ways to play Bond: stiff and rigid, and nervous. Those, those were mm -hmm. his two, only two things that I saw him do, like his emotions. But in a way, it felt like I was, they were filming it in like linear time because towards the end, I saw him finally getting to what Bond was about. The 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 strongest that I saw Craig as a performer was definitely in the torture scene. Like that was just solid acting right there. That was just, that was amazing. Um, but I, you said you saw the humor. I didn't see any humor in him. I, I thought at he all. was. I thought he. It was. It must have been so subtle. I didn't even see it. Oh no! Because I, I thought oh, he was I humorless. I, I, I thought he was I humorless. I disagree with you on this. I think that he. I, the thing I like is that this is like pro, this book. I believe is not was one of the first Bond books. It was, was the first. It was Bond the novel. first Bond it's book. It's the first and novel. This, you actually see the origins of the character, and I like that. Yeah. I like how you see how I he becomes this see emotionless the person. Like for instance, they had him seduce uh, the uh, the financier's wife. <laughs> And they kept saying things like, and this is not mm -hmm. Craig's fault at all. This is the fault of the screenwriter. They're like, oh, 
I see you have no emotional, they say you have no emotional attachment to women. It's very clear because he's watching them drag this woman's body off the beach that mm -hmm. had been tortured. And they said, you don't like women very much. And like these like ham handed things, like, like walking in and going, that guy right there, he hates cereal. And, and you, you only see him like eat like one bowl of cereal like half heartedly. You only have one example. The next example you see of him with a woman is this very caring scene where she's in the, the, the shower Ava after, Green. yeah, uh, Vesper Lynn. I'm like, well, wait a second, you just announced to the world that this guy's terrible with women and he's very cold hearted. And then halfway through the movie, you have him in this very emotional scene in the show. That didn't make any sense to me. I Actually, I but, but I, 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 yeah, because you're, you're making it like that scene happened right after he made a comment. And there was stuff in between. Uh, the Vesper Lynn character is the only female character he's had to work with up to this point, spend that much time with on that level. It's not, a, it's not like a job contact that he's just a means to an end kind of situation. He has to work with this woman. So they're kind of thrusting the situation together. And so there was time between the time when he first met her on the train, which is a very well scripted sequence yes, between them and, uh, uh, and very well acted between the two of them. On up the until the moment the, on the plane when they on the train. met. No, on they met train. on a train. They met on a train and they were going to the actual casino. I thought you Royale. went through this movie like a fine tooth comb. Oh, I comb. thought that was on a plane. I'm sorry. It looked like a plane inside. Well, it's you didn't go through this movie yeah, like did. a fine tooth comb. Well, that's when they had that stupid Busted. line, I'm your penny. How, or, how, I'm your money. And it's like How about the whole opening shot with the train? And then we cut to Daniel Craig having dinner on the train. <laughs> well, guys, I don't want to keep. I don't want to keep. Uh, we we gotta wrap this up. But I want to. Well, just... how can we wrap this up? We should be talking about well, this for like a good well, fifteen well, minutes. I wanna, yeah, we should be. Be like uh, this, is, this is a great topic here. I mean, I'm enjoying this, guys. But I want to just. I'll wrap this up on what will final for each of us. I will say this. Eva Green is a phenomenal James Bond girl. In fact, she's one of my favorites. Daniel Craig has potential to be as good as Connery, if not better. I'm really looking forward to the next film. I, I, I really. Let, let's. Uh, this is the best Bond film. film. I'm, I'm going to go on record here. This is the best Bond, Bond I have seen since I, I, I'd say in about 20 years. I, I loved every minute of it. I want to talk about this film more. Well, we why will. We, 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 we got to go. We got to go. We have. Why, we why have are time. we cutting this short? People, we only got 28 minutes. Why don't we just do this in show two? Uh, because that's because uh, we got we have to we have a lot of things to talk about today. So we gotta do our next show. We could have pushed Rock and Roll Cinema. We've done that so many times. We can't do a whole show on Casino Royale. We, we could have done, done a whole we, show we on Casino Royale. We could have done 15 to 20 minutes. We could have definitely got going on that.